thank you very much for the invitation. It's a, a, a real pleasure to um, be able to share my research with you. Um, and today I'm, I'm going to talk about some experiments that we have run here in, in Erlangen um, with my supervisors, uh, looking at the individual differences in the earlier stages of uh, incidental second language morphosyntax learning. Um, just a very brief outline. I'll, I'll start with uh, some um, uh, background information for this project, then talk about these uh, three experiments that we have run, um, some conclusions to bring it all together at the end, and I'll just finish with mentioning some ways in which uh, future research uh, could uh, expand on, on our results. Um, right, so this project um, builds on the idea that there are some um, differences in the way adults and uh, children and adults acquire their first and second language, um, respectively. So, for example, children um, tend to learn languages, acquire language primarily uh, implicitly, uh, which means uh, rather automatically, simply by being exposed to input. And in contrast to that, you have adults who uh, tend to learn uh, a language um, largely um, explicitly, um, that is, um, intentionally through often deliberate and effortful processing. Um, and now one of the um, overarching questions in the literature looking at these two learning processes is to see, um, to, to explore the extent to which implicit processes are also involved in second language acquisition and whether adults can acquire um, implicit knowledge, implicit linguistic knowledge. Um, now to, to gain a better understanding of the um, mechanisms that are underlie, that underlie uh, second language acquisition, researchers have often um, tested learners under two different conditions, uh, intentional and uh, incidental exposure conditions, and just to give some information about both of them. Uh, so when we're talking about intentional exposure, we refer to situations where um, learners are given explicit um, information about the learning targets, or they are instructed to um, uh, engage in um, deliberate hypothesis testing or uh, rule memorization. And these situations uh, tend to favor the engagement of um, explicit learning processes, which lead predominantly to the development of um, explicit knowledge. And on the other hand, you have incidental exposures, incidental exposure conditions. And here we, we refer to situations where um, learners are not given any information about the learning target or the and the presence of the uh, subsequent test phase, and they're left on their own to discover what is going on. And these contexts um, usually are considered to uh, favor the involvement of implicit learning processes, and again, result mainly in the development of implicit knowledge. Um, some previous research, um, mainly employing artificial and semi-artificial uh, paradigms, have reported uh, um, an advantage of learning under intentional uh, conditions. Um, but we still have a wealth of evidence um, that adults succeed in learning um, some um, grammatical structures under incidental conditions. And this happens often very frequently, which is, well, uh, amazing uh, findings, actually. Now, the thing is that in some cases, for example, studies looking at the acquisition of uh, inflectional morphology, they tend to report uh, small learning effects, um, sort of like 60% or something like this. Uh, and there could be three factors um, potentially overlapping that could lead to, to which these difficulties could be attributed. Um, first, we have some, we may have some limitations that are imposed on learners by the nature of implicit learning. So as we mentioned before, so in incidental conditions, usually we have, well, not only, but we have mostly implicit learning that is taking place. But as we get older, we kind of, the ability to learn languages implicitly kind of decreases. Um, also, in most of these studies, uh, participants, uh, the, the amount of input that participants received were quite um, limited. So everything took place in a single session. And these perhaps have, might have not been enough for um, robust knowledge, for robust learning effects to occur. And then the third factor could be related to um, learners' uh, previous first language experience. So here we know that 
these experience tunes our perceptual system to sort of like um, expect or look for particular features. And this tuning can interfere with uh, subsequent second language processing. Now, um, as we all know, um, natural languages are highly complex and therefore isolating specific uh, structures and looking at how learners uh, acquire them and what factors involved in the acquisition process can be an almost impossible endeavor. Um, now, the good thing is that these, these problem can be to some extent overcome by using artificial language paradigms, which serve as test tube models uh, for um, natural acquisition. And these paradigms allow researchers to, to exert full control over the um, conditions, um, the learning conditions, so the amount of exposure that participants get, the type of structures or patterns that they are exposed to, um, the conditions in which learning takes place, and so on. And this brings us to um, our first experiment. So here in this experiment, we wanted to revisit the question of whether adults can learn um, second language grammar under incidental exposure conditions. We also wanted to see how they, how well they do with uh, word order and case marking. And um, we were also interested in looking at what, what happens if you give participants even more exposure. So will we get a robust learning effects? effect towards the end of the um, towards the end of the study or just simply um, like these learning effects that previous research has um, um, demonstrated. Um, and finally, we wanted to see what happens. So what, what is the effect of Lernacy's previous um, first language background and how it affect how it affects uh, learning outcomes? Um, OK, so this is why we created a, a new artificial language. We called it uh, Capitalo. And in order to um, keep participants engaged for the whole duration of the study and try to minimize uh, withdrawal rates, we inserted some gamification elements. Um, I, there is a, I can give you some information about it um, at the end if we have some time. Um, OK, so we had two groups of participants. We had native speakers of English. Um, we try to keep them as monolingual uh, as possible. And we also had native speakers of German. Here we try to make sure that these participants did not have um, knowledge of any language that had case marking. Um, all participants completed five uh, sessions. Uh, the whole thing took place online um, in the um, uh, Gorilla experiment uh, platform. Um, and the language that they uh, were exposed to looked like this. So the lexicon comprised um, 14 bisyllabic pseudo words. There were eight nouns referring to um, uh, eight aliens, four verbs corresponding to um, four different actions, and two adjectives, um, one for a green and one for a red color. Um, now, in terms of grammar, Kepidala had case marking. Um, the nouns were evenly um, distributed into two classes. Um, class one nouns had the suffix, the nominative suffix a, class uh, two nouns had the nominative suffix e, but all of them had the same uh, marker in the accusative case, o. Um, so as I mentioned before, well, um, well the adjectives were um, optional and they agreed in, um, they appeared, they occurred post-nominally and they uh, agreed in class and case uh, with a noun they modified. Um, now, in terms of word order, the uh, um, the language was um, a verb final, uh, but the position of the subject and object was uh, free to vary, resulting into two different word orders. As you can see here, there was a more frequent SOV1 and a less frequent or non-canonical OSV1. Um, and these two examples here, they um, the meaning of these two sentences, again, is the same. Um, case marking is, uh, again, what um, makes the difference here. Um, and this is how uh, um, the design of the study looked like. So in the first session, uh, we trained participants on the nouns of the language to sort of accelerate the whole learning process. And immediately after that, we exposed them to the um, whole vocabulary. Um, using a task that served, well, a, a, a dual purpose, actually. So the first first one um, was to, again, familiarize participants with the vocabulary of the language. 
not just the nouns, and also incidentally expose them to the um, grammatical structures uh, that were present in, in this language. And following that, there was uh, a grammar test that participants had to complete. Um, these two tasks were repeated in sessions two, three, and four. And finally, um, in session five, participants' knowledge was, grammar knowledge was tested by means of a grammaticality judgment task. Um, okay, so see here some, some information about the task and how they looked like. Um, this is the noun pre-training. Um, so here participants were presented with, with uh, four aliens and they would hear the name for one of them, um, which was something like this. Irda. Yeah. And then they would have to select the correct alien and receive feedback. Um, following that, they were given a, um, a lexical training task, which was essentially a two alternative forced choice task. And here they would listen to a sentence. Uh, um, let me see this. Oh. Belga Prado Varek. Okay, it didn't cut off fairly. Okay, so uh, the sentence was something like this, and then here we had a target and um, a foil, uh, a, a distractor item, and crucially the two scenes um, differed only by a single element. So here the aliens are doing uh, are the same, but they're doing a different action. So this was aimed at um, basically training participants on, on the verbs of the language. Um, yeah, so the... Um, Grammatical comprehension test looked like this. So here, um, participants did not receive feedback. And importantly, uh, the um, two scenes um, only um, referred in that the age and patient roles of the aliens were uh, reversed. Um, so to get it right, you have to basically pay attention to the case marking, to the case markers in, in most uh, sentences. Um, and finally, there was a, a grammaticality judgment task. Again, participants did not receive feedback here. Uh, there were 80 trials. Ungrammatical sentences could have um, either a word order or case marking violations. Um, word order violations uh, in, these, in these sentences, either the verb or the adjective <coughs> was in the wrong position. Um, whereas for case marking violations, um, either both nouns had the same marker or there was a, a noun adjective agreement error. Um, and here, before I move on to the results of the first experiment, um, this is some information about the um, analysis that we run. Um, data from all, task, from all tasks except for the um, pre-training task were submitted to a, a different mixed effects model. Um, so accuracy was um, uh, binary coded as a correct or incorrect. And our categorical variables, we um, effect coded them, um, effectively centering them at zero. And we also uh, centered the pre-training and added it as a um, continuous predictor. Um, okay, now um, starting with the lexical, the results from the lexical training task. So as you can see here, participants were quite accurate on, uh, on these tasks. Uh, and even from the first session, they were um, above, well, they, they, were, they were doing quite well and they continued, their performance continued to improve over time. Um, um, and the same pattern uh, was present in both uh, English participants and native speakers of German. And the type of sentence did not, this, the type of word order did not have an effect here. So um, performance was, accuracy rates were, were virtually identical. Now, this was not the case, however, in the grammat grammatical comprehension test. So here, as you can see, starting with the uh, native speakers of English first, there was a main effect of uh, word order. So participants were much more accurate uh, on the um, more frequent SOV word order. And this pattern actually remained stable over time. So in fact, actually performance improved on SOV, but not on the um, uh, OSV sentences. Um, and Moving on to the German, to the German participants, the, again the pattern of performance is similar here, but um, we, we we also had an, a main effect of word order, but in contrast to the um, um, to English uh, learners, uh, to English speakers, uh, performance on both um, types of on both word orders improved um, over time, um, as you can see here. Um, now, 
the results from the grammatical judgment task again here both groups demonstrated a similar pattern of performance so as you can see we have high uh, high high accuracy rates on grammatical trials but not in ungrammatical sentences and this is because um uh, when we plotted what happened in the ungrammatical sentences we found out that actually participants did not learn case marking and again this was um th this was the case for both groups um both performed quite um well on um, sentences involving word order violations but not on those that had case marking errors now having said that there was a, a group error type interaction indicating that uh, the native speakers of german were um, more accurate on case marking sentences compared to their um, uh, l1 english counterparts um, and just um, a summary of this first experiment uh, so we found that participants quickly learn the novel word reference mappings, but despite that, and despite receiving extensive exposure, uh, they only demonstrated uh, limited um, grammar learning outcomes. Um, now, having said that, the difficulties did not apply uniformly to all aspects of language, but they were more uh, pronounced on uh, for um, in inflectional um, morphology. Um, and despite that, we have some uh, evidence of learning. And these are mainly the fact that um, learners learn the, actually the, 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 the verb final character of the language. They also had a partial understanding of the adjective noun order, and they uh, learned that SOV was the canonical word order of the language. Now, I'll just focus on the third of, of these uh, points uh, briefly. Uh, just to, to give you some reasons of why um, why participants preferred this pattern over the other one. So the first one could be that this is a result of um, this is the, the result of frequency effect. So the SOV was a more frequent word order. So this is why um, its learning was the, the frequency promoted its its learning basically. Um, another factor could be that. Um, in this context, participants may, might have shown a subject first bias. So basically, by putting subjects first, uh, they could engage in a simple, relatively simple um, sequential processing, which was less cognitively taxing than looking for, uh, than relying on case marking um, information. And another reason for this, for these uh, preference could be traced back to the um, L1 effects on L2 learning. Um, and um, here, uh, we could make a different story for the two groups. Um, for example, for L1 uh, German learners, so here, um, when they are presented with strings that are uh, noun, noun, verb in their L1, um, native speakers of German tend to interpret them as SOV. So therefore, they could have transfer this preference from their L1 to L2. Uh, and this is why they performed like this here. For the native speakers of English, this could be um, different. This, a different um, story could be made. So the results have, can appear to seem, to, well, seem more related to the notion of meta transfer. So what happens here is that in um, native speakers of English, it relies strictly on word order cues to assign grammatical roles. But when they are when they are given um, noun noun verb sentences in their first language, they usually interpret them as OSV. So they could so instead of basically here instead of transferring this preference for a, a surface uh, pattern, they could have transferred the preference for a a word order as a main interpretation cue from their L1 to L2, and there, these preference could have uh, sort of like interacted with frequency effects. Um, so since SOV was more available or more frequent, uh, this might have led learners to abandon their um, previous um, um, preferences for the more available, um, the more um, available uh, pattern in the input. Um, OK, and then just building on these L1 effects, um, I've already mentioned um, um, 
um, how they may come into play. But what was interesting uh, was that these effects uh, actually became stronger over time. So if you look at the top two plots, in the first two uh, sessions, performance was almost similar, was almost identical in the uh, two blo in the, for the two um, groups. But after that, uh, it began to, to diverge. So German, native speakers of German improved over time. And again, taking um, a competition model perspective here, we could make an argument that um, in these conditions, for example, um, learners move from um, they tend to learn one cue at a time, so they they may prefer focusing on to, to focus on word order word order first, um, probably because it's easier. But then the extent to which they make a, a shift uh, to case marking um, gradually later on during the um, uh, over the course of the of the experiment, and the extent to which this shift will be made may be determined by um, the first the first language of participants. So. And German is a morphologically richer language. It has um, it has case marking, so this is why um, we have we might have had this pattern um, of uh, results here. And now building on these differences, we wanted to see in the second experiment, which was an extension of this one, what happens if you give participants even more exposure. So will we find a, an even bigger shift in their uh, um, reliance from word order to case marking, or we will still see these uh, small incremental changes in um, participants' performance. And a second question that we had here was um, whether the uh, whether participants' performance in this task was related to the um, the emergence of metalinguistic awareness of the metalinguistic awareness about the uh, um, grammatical structure of the language. And this come this question, the second question comes from um, some previous studies that have found both that both implicit and explicit knowledge are at play um, under incidental conditions, with even explicit knowledge sometimes being more um, important uh, for case marking. Um, so um, we only tested native speakers of German in this study, um, which was again an extension of the previous one. So what happened here was that uh, after the end, after the, after the first grammaticality judgment task, we gave participants two more blocks of lexical training and comprehension test of grammatical comprehension test, and we also asked them to. Um, do one more grammaticality judgment task. And to, at the very end of the study, uh, we um, gave them a metalinguistic awareness questionnaire. Um, since I've already um, talked about the previous task, I'll just uh, focus on the uh, this questionnaire uh, just to give you some more information about how it looked like. So basically, there were two parts in this questionnaire. Um, the, in the first one, the first one had six questions. Um, the first one was uh, we actually presented participants with uh, an OSV trial from the grammar test, and we asked them to select one of the pictures and explain why they um, chose this one. And we also um, um, presented them with ungrammatical sentences and again asked them whether they could identify and explain what is wrong in the sentence. Um, we transcribed these uh, responses and they were coded by two uh, authors and we found high um, inter-rated um, reliability here. Um, and in the second part, um, we had a questionnaire that looked like this. So essentially, um, there were some statements about the language and participants had to say um, whether they think that these statements are correct or uh, incorrect. And uh, we uh, summed the um, number of correct responses in both uh, parts, and we uh, had a total um, uh, total score uh, for all participants. Um, okay, so before I show you the results, again, the, the process was uh, identical to that of the uh, previous experiment. The only difference is that we added metalinguistic awareness as a predictor here. Um, 
Okay, starting with the lexical training, you see that uh, in the last two sessions, um, participants um, were almost um, were likely to perform at ceiling in this uh, in this test, but um, this was not the case in the um, uh, gram grammatical comprehension test. So if you focus on the last two sessions again, we found some improvements, but there was there was no evidence for. Uh, for any major shift in performance. So basi basically, again, they gradually um, improved, but uh, nothing um, major happened. So th the nice finding is that um, there was more individual variation towards the end of the study, um, more, more so compared to the beginning of the, um, uh, to the first session, for example. Um, and then, for the grammaticality judgment task, so if you see, if you look at the x-axis here, um, we have test time one and test time two uh, for both types of ungrammatical sentences. So these are only the ungrammatical sentences here, and we didn't find any major changes in performance. Uh, now moving to the more um, to the cool stuff for these from this experiment, we found um, a metalinguistic awareness effect. Um, and as you can see here, we have three um, three lines corresponding to uh, low metalinguistic awareness scores, uh, average and high scores. And um, well, here importantly, the, the 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 nice thing here is that this effect actually emerged um, became stronger over time. So if you look at the first two sessions, uh, participants actually all all participants performed um, with um, well, um, similar um, uh, accuracy rates, but they again the their performance began to diverge from session three onwards, uh, and towards the the end of the study, actually those participants that had higher um, uh, scores were um, almost um, were were quite accurate on on these tasks were very accurate, um, and um, more more. Uh, evidence for the effect of metalinguistic awareness emerged from the uh, uh, grammaticality judgment task. So here we found uh, grammaticality, uh, metalinguistic awareness interaction, and as you can see from the um, red line, um, participants with higher metalinguistic awareness scores were more likely to detect the, um, the errors in the ungrammatical sentences, whereas this was not probably the case for those that had very high, uh, very low scores. Um, so just again to bring it um, to, to um, summarize the findings from these um, from the second experiment, we found only partial learning of the grammatical structures and uh, given uh, giving uh, more exposure did not lead to um, led only to very small learning gains actually. Um, now, the interesting part here was that we found a link between um, participants' performance in the um, grammar tasks and their, uh, the emergence of the um, metalinguistic awareness about the structures in the language. And this was found in, well, under incidental conditions. Um, and finally, we found um, both in this experiment and in the previous one, we found um, individual differences in participants' performance. So they, they, um, they, there was some variation in, in how well uh, participants did in, in these experiments. And this is what we had in mind, actually, when we were designing the, um, the, the, the project, the, the, the experiments. Um, so we wanted to expand on it. Um, um, and this is what I'm going to talk about in the third experiment, which sort of expand, uh, was aimed at expanding the, the current literature on the cognitive abilities, on individual differences in cognitive abilities in um, second language acquisition. Um, so here, the, the idea is that although we, um, most cognitive linguists assume that um, linguistic knowledge is built up from experience using um, domain general cognitive abilities, um, now what abilities and what mechanisms support the analysis of language input and how they do so at different stages again is sort of still somewhat unclear. 
Um, and again, we have previous studies that have focused mainly on looking at uh, individual differences in different types of memory, um, which was great, but it was a very small, um, it's, it's a very small subset of um, uh, in the, of cognitive, cognitive abilities that have been tested so far in these contexts. Um, uh, and uh, we know from these studies that different abilities may exert their effect um, differentially at various stages of um, acquisition, language acquisition. So the aim here was to um, expand on the research by exploring how individual differences in the new set of cognitive abilities that are thought to be um, advantageous for second language acquisition uh, underpin both vocabulary and grammar um, learning at different stages of exposure. And these were, as you can see here, implicit statistical learning, explicit learning, and sustained attention abilities. Um, and the research questions here were, were these two. So we wanted to see which of the abilities will actually um, uh, predict performance on vocabulary and grammar and whether their effects will remain stable or whether they would change over the course of the experiment again. Um, so here um, again the study design. Unfortunately for these experiments we only have data for the native speakers of English. Um, this is because we conducted this study first. Um, I wish I had more um, more to show you from native speakers of German, but I we don't have anything uh, now. Perhaps we'll build on it uh, at some point in the future. Um, but as you can see here, um, uh, participants were actually asked to complete an a cognitive ability task at the end of each of the first three uh, sessions. Um, and here are the tasks, the measures that we used for the implicit statistical learning task. We used a, a visual learning task basically um, developed by Ziegelmann. So here learners were exposed to a continuous stream of shapes, which again, unbeknownst to them, um, comprised of, uh, consisted of eight sequences of three shapes, uh, just like you can see here in the figure. Um, obviously participants were not given any information about it. They were just, they were told to um, look at the screen, uh, see some shapes, and then they will be asked some questions about them later on. And the questions that they were asked looked like this. So um, essentially we had four choice trials again. There were either um, um, here, um, participants either had to discriminate between a target and a foil triplet. Um, so it's a pattern recognition trial, or they had to complete they had the pattern completion trials in which they had to com to choose which um, which of the three shapes that they were given, which of the shapes that they were given best completes the the pattern based on what they've learned in the previous part of the uh, of the of the uh, task. Uh, sustained attention was essentially a, a go no go task, so participants were asked to press spacebar whenever they would see the letter X, and explicit learning was tested using a a, a task that was. Um, as similar as possible to the implicit learning one. So here the difference is that um, obviously there were different shapes, but the end of the triplet was explicitly marked by by uh, a cross. And also learners were told that there will be some, um, they have to um, memorize them, pay attention to the triplets and, and memorize them. And the trials, the test trials were identical to the ones that you see here. Um, okay, and again, we had um, mixed effects results for the um, lexical training for all for all the tasks. Starting with the lexical training, we found positive effects of explicit learning and sustained attention, and we found some interesting interactions between session and explicit learning, and session and implicit uh, statistical learning. And we plotted them alongside, and the pattern was like this. So basically, the effect. Um, I talked about that, that there was a, again we found here an interesting pattern with the explicit learning effect becoming stronger over time and significant in the last two sessions and on the other hand implicit statistical learning being uh, positive and significant only in the first one and attenuating over time and then in the grammatical comprehension test um, again th things here were um, 
not the results were not that rich. Uh, we had a uh, significant session explicit learning interaction. Again, we plotted it next to the uh, implicit um, implicit uh, learning uh, implicit learning session interaction, and the pattern was similar again. Uh, so, explicit learning improved over time. Uh, the effect increased over time, and it was significant in the and positive in the in the last two sessions. And on the other hand, again, implicit learning was um, um, positive at the beginning, but became negative towards the end of the um, of the study. Um, and um, here in the grammaticality judgment task, we had an um, effects of explicit and um, explicit learning and attention, and they were qualified by an interaction there. Um, and this interaction post hoc analysis revealed that the positive effect of explicit learning was actually present only for learners that had um, average or above average or high sustained attention scores. Um, and then, okay, so this is how we interpreted um, our results. So first of all, we had a positive effect of uh, sustained attention, which means that failure to probably failure to sustain attention in these tasks could be either due to task complexity or due to task monotony or both. Um, and um, we also had, an, uh, as I said before, we had an interesting, um, interesting interactions between these two learning abilities and session. And we thought that um, this is because, for example, at the um, the way we interpreted the results was that at early stages performance was guided by implicit learning effects. So basically, uh, participants that had better skills were better able at. Uh, tracking the transitional probabilities, uh, um, that yeah, the transitional probabilities between syllables and the coherent statistics, and this allowed them to uh, segment the speech stream and identify and uh, store the words, and also by by paying attention to the um, uh, distributional information, they could discern words that occur in similar distributional patterns, and um, this. Could have facilitated grammatical categorization and learning of some regularities, so that, for example, the verbs occur in sentence final position and that the language is a verb final language. Uh, but um, as um, as a study progressed, uh, a conscious and strategic processing became more effective. Uh, so here, participants could have used their earlier knowledge to to guide their subsequent um, subsequent learning basically, either by um, formulating and testing specific hypotheses or by focusing on specific aspect of, aspects of, of grammar. Um, and this is uh, like a, a quick conclusion to bring it all together. Um, so we found only partial learning of the uh, grammatical structures um, in, in these experiments. Participants learned the, OS, the SOV word order, but not the OSV one. They learned some aspects of word order, but not case marking. Um, and from the first two experiments, we have some uh, L1 effects, which um, importantly became stronger over time. And from the second and the third experiment, we have results that highlight the um, beneficial effect of uh, explicit learning and explicit knowledge in the um, um, acquisition process during under these conditions. Um, and given that our results echo some previous research that has um, demonstrated low um, learning effects for um, aspects like case market or low salient forms, it seems that for these forms to be acquired effectively, ex explicit types of instructions can be seen as a, as a precondition in, in, in some way. Um, and also our results highlight the, the need for some um, future studies, not micro longitudinal, but not necessarily uh, that um, um, test how different cognitive abilities interact at different stages of uh, development of L2 development to find when the best time for uh, providing feedback or explicit instruction is. So essentially, should we leave some space for implicit learning at the beginning? Um, or statistical learning, and then um, we it would be also interesting to see what happens, what will happen if we test learners that come from an even morphologically richer um, L1 background. Um, 
also um, to test for potential differences between adult and child learners um, and to have more um, direct findings about the uh, relationships uh, the relationship between the first and second language acquisition and artificial language uh, learning um, and finally we can see how a learner uh, internal cognitive abilities interact with uh, learner external factors like uh, redundancy or saliency or um, other frequency or other aspects um, in the language um, and then I have some references here um, and special thanks to my supervisors and collaborators Professor Eva Dombrovska, um, Dr. Miguel Lopard-Casilla and Dr. Diana Pilimos and thank you all for listening